for Hoosier History Live, a weekly adventure through Indiana history with author, speaker, and connoisseur of all things Hoosier, Nelson Price. The call-in number is 317-788-3314. And now on to Hoosier History Live. Good afternoon and welcome to Hoosier History Live. I'm your host, Nelson Price. Thanks for joining us as we explore an Indianapolis landmark that's turning 150 years old. It's the third largest private cemetery in the country and its history has been intertwined with the Hoosier capital since the 1860s. Crown Hill Cemetery is the burial site of more American vice presidents, there are three of them there, than any other cemetery. It's also the gravesite of notables ranging from bank robber John Dillinger to Hoosier poet James Whitcomb Riley to former Indianapolis Colts owner Robert Ursay. In connection with its milestone anniversary, Crown Hill is the focus of a lavish new book titled Crown Hill History, Spirit, Sanctuary. Just like the book, we're going to explore a range of aspects today. Um, I, uh, we're going to explore everything from the very beginning beginnings of Crown Hill, um, which was created as a result of challenges at the city's very first uh, pioneer cemetery, to the public safety section at Crown Hill for police officers and firefighters. We'll discuss cemetery artifacts, uh, issues related to vandalism and theft. There's been a miraculous outcome in one case, and we'll explore as many other aspects as we can in terms of the rich history. There have been more than 200,000 burials at Crown Hill since 1864. There's some extremely poignant stories about some of the funerals, some of the grave markers, and even the flowers that have become part of the landscape, uh, at least every spring. For all this, I'm joined in studio by three guests. They are Keith Norwalk, president of Crown Hill Cemetery and its Heritage Foundation, uh, Bloomington-based journalist Doug Wissing, who wrote a lot of the text for the new book, and I'm joined by Marty Davis of the Crown Hill Heritage Foundation. Marty with Richard Fields took many of the color photos featured in the book. Uh, this is certain to be a captivating show, and it's a pleasure to say welcome to Hoosier History Live, Doug, Keith, and Marty. Good to be here. Thank Good you. to be here. Thank you. Terrific to have you guys here. To elaborate, my guest Keith Norwalk is a civic leader who has been Crown Hill's president since 1991. Marty Davis has worked at Crown Hill for more than 30 years. She specializes in nature photography and among other responsibilities at Crown Hill. She coordinates many of the tours and events. I'm going to mention her husband Tom Davis is a popular guide for the theme tours. And my guest Doug Wissing has won extensive acclaim for his international coverage. He's reported on everything from the war in Afghanistan to a missionary in Tibet. Closer to home, Doug has won awards from the Indiana Historical Society, which published the book, Crown Hill History Spirit Sanctuary. In terms of Crown Hill, we will, of course, discuss some of the notable Hoosiers buried there. We'll explore what happens to coins and other mementos left by visitors at burial sites, including at John Dillinger's grave, and we'll explore the Pioneer Cemetery at Crown Hill and an AIDS memorial there. So there's a lot to get to here. And by the way, some of the best attended funerals at Crown Hills in Crown Hills history may have been for people you never heard of. So there truly is a lot to cover on today's show. And later in the program, you can call in and ask us questions or share comments and insights on this captivating topic. Hoosier History Live is the only live radio show about a state's history in the entire country with listener call-in. Also during today's show, we'll have a report from our road tripper, and we'll have the Hoosier History Trivia Mystery with a prize to the listener who calls in with the correct answer. Now, turning to my guests, Keith Norwalk, Marty Davis, and Doug Wissing. Keith, I said in the intro that this uh, that Crown Hill is the third largest private cemetery in the country, so that begs the question, listeners are probably wondering, what are the two, two that are larger? The, the largest uh, cemetery in the country is located in California. Uh, one that's very notable is number two, which is Spring Grove Cemetery in Cincinnati. And they have 660 acres to our 150. Oh, well, thank you for uh, being specific there. Now, let's start at the genesis of everything. And uh, I want to explore the deepest history that led to the creation of 
Crown Hill Cemetery um, in its opening in 1863-1864, so 150 years ago. Um, this has come up, by the way, on other Hoosier History Live shows when we discuss lost cemeteries. In Indianapolis, our first major graveyard was called Green Lawn Cemetery, located near the White River, and uh, there were several challenges with Green Lawn. Doug, can you kind of weigh in on what happened? Yeah, when when uh, Indianapolis was first laid out in the eight, about 1820, 1821, uh, Ralston, the man who designed uh, Indianapolis, included a cemetery that was just just outside his grid, uh, which would have been down on Kentucky Avenue. Uh, just past the intersection of South and West Streets. And the problem was is this essentially was wilderness. So the first mm-hmm. burials, they had to bushwhack along the river to get to the, the place where they were <laughs> going to bury the people. Um, it was it was frontier Indiana. Mm-hmm. And there were flooding problems with Green Lawn. And then taking us up to the era when Crown Hill was created, uh, Civil War, I know from what you've written in the book, uh, Civil War kind of overwhelmed Green Lawn. Yeah, it, by 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 the time we got to the Civil War, Greenlawn started as about a five acre site, and by the time we got to the Civil War, it was about twenty five acres in in size. And the Civil War just overwhelmed the cemetery. Indianapolis became a great Union camp because of our railroad connections at that point. Mm-hmm. And then we had giant prison camps here, including Camp Morton, mm-hmm. that had about eleven thousand yeah Confederate, Confederate prisoners. prisoners. Uh-huh. And the death rates were very high in all the prison camps, including uh, Camp Morton. About seven, more than 1,700 Confederate soldiers died, mm-hmm. and that just completely overwhelmed that cemetery. So it then brought the Indianapolis leaders to the point where they recognized they needed a new cemetery, and that that was the great movement toward the establishment of Crown Hill. Yes, and that gets – they wanted the cemetery because of flooding problems. Part of the thinking was – create this new cemetery on high ground. And, um, Marty, I'd like you to weigh in on this uh, initial, when this all happened, Crown Hill was truly the highest ground in the city limits, correct? And now we can't quite say that. That is correct. Because of the uh, expansion of the county, we're no longer the highest elevation. Uh, that would be in the northwest part of the county, out in a normal neighborhood. Oh, like Eagle Creek area? Yeah, or, uh-huh. in that neck of the woods, right. Mm-hmm. But our uh, the crown is uh, 842 feet, a little bit more than that. And so we look like we're definitely the highest elevation. But we mm-hmm. say we like to say we're the highest hill because we really can't say that we're the highest elevation. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But at least prior to Unigov, uh, highest right. ground. Right. And as, in addition to moving to high ground, the idea, I think, was to create a park-like setting. So, Keith, can you explain? Um, I, I had not been familiar with the American Cemetery Movement, and I know you want to share about that. Yes. Uh, we are one of the prime examples of uh, a cemetery as one of the original uh, uh, American rural cemeteries. And this comes back to, or goes back to, actually the um, inception of our country in the late 1700s. Uh, during the Puritanical movement, there was uh, a, a very macabre sense of death, and uh, many of the cemeteries were located in, in towns with industry, and they were moved, and, and uh, there was a uh, reaction to that in the early years of the Romantic era. And this was a reverence of nature and also practically moving the cemeteries out of the cities so that they would be there forever. Mm-hmm. And so um, we d- certainly do exhibit a reverence for nature. You'll find. Oh, we're going to get into that on the show. Yeah. Exactly. You'll find mm-hmm. our uh, 25 miles of paved road are very circuitous. Yeah. Uh, it's very. I always get lost. Yeah. Very easy to get lost in the cemetery, and this was because the roads foul the contour of the land. Uh, there's no symmetry to the trees. And um, so we have honored those traditions from the early uh-huh. 1860s. And I've always been told 100 years ago people picnicked at Crown Hill. Very definitely, mm-hmm. very definitely. 
Um, since we're talking about the high ground and everything, I think a lot of our listeners probably are aware that James Whitcomb Riley, the Hoosier poet who died in 1916, he had grown up in Greenfield, and then uh, the last nearly 30 years of his life, he lived in a home in the Lockerbie neighborhood, um, and he was honored by being um, you, you can't say buried, he's entombed, correct, at the right. ha- crown of Crown Hill. Um, and before that, he had lay in state in the rotunda of the state house, just like a politician. He was that beloved. Um, Doug, can you kind of share what happened there? There was a tug of war in 1916 after he died about where he would be uh, laid to rest. Well, you know, People, I think, today don't understand Riley's popularity in, in his I era. Know. Where he was mm-hmm. a, it's hard to explain a poet. Being he, he was a best-selling author for sure. He was a, he was a perennial bestseller for, uh, for, the, for his publisher here. And um, when he died, he, he had become a luminary here. And everybody assumed he would want to be buried here. But his hometown of Greenfield also made a case mm-hmm. that he should be buried there because they wanted their favorite son to come back home. And that's most of the stories of his youth were played, were set mm-hmm. in Greenfield, the old swimming hole. And of and course there are restored historic homes both in Greenfield and in mm-hmm. Lockerbie. That's right. And so everybody wanted, wanted Riley and, and, <laughs> but, but Crown Hill had Riley. He was in the, he was in the, uh, the waiting station. He was mm-hmm. in a vault in the waiting station waiting. And uh, as I was saying earlier, possession is 90% of the law. Uh, we had his body. So the uh, what eventually happened is that Crown Hill offered to build a memorial for him at the apex of Crown Hill. And that seemed to trump all the offers yeah. that, that Greenfield, <laughs> that Greenfield had. OK. And since we're on this topic, uh, Marty, as a photographer, uh, the cover of the new book is shot uh, clearly from the crown of Crown Hill. Um, I People go it is so scenic photographers come all the time what is your favorite other than that i assume in terms of shooting a cityscape nothing beats that vantage point nothing beats it from anywhere oh that is your favorite well no i mean in the whole city you can't you can't capture Mm -hmm. the city except from there i agree with you Mm -hmm. how about elsewhere in the cemetery for all photographers listening you know there's it really kind of depends on the time of day and the time of year but one of my favorite vantage points, besides that one, of course, is right after you come in the 34th Street gate and you're looking up the the curved road that goes mm-hmm. into the cemetery because the way the light changes through the day can make that so dramatic. And that's true of really a lot of the cemetery. My favorite time of the day to shoot is the golden hour, which is, you know, right after sunset. It's sunset. Uh-huh. And so that changes the cemetery. And so... I don't know that I have a super favorite vantage point because of that, because uh-huh. the light is so magical. Uh-huh. All right. Well, uh, now in terms of uh, famous Hoosiers buried there, we're going to talk about Dillinger. But before we get to the uh, bank robber, I want to talk about the heroes, the cops and the firefighters and the public safety section. And um, uh, Marty and Keith can weigh in on this. You have a public safety memorial at Crown Hill. Uh, Can you share details? Right. The Heroes of Public Safety section was opened exactly a year after 9-11. And it was opened to have a very permanent place that was uh, very prominent for the uh, public safety servants. And, um, right, you know, there it's, it's not just for the people that are buried at Crown Hill. That memorial engraved on the base of it are, uh, 644 names of our public safety servants that have died in the line of duty in mm-hmm. the state of Indiana. And that, uh, with the first one starting, uh, with a firefighter who died in, uh, well, he died a long time ago. Uh-huh. Sorry, I didn't write that. Oh, down. that's all right. Anyway, but it, and it goes up to the present. And our most current, of course, was Rod Bradway, who uh-huh. was buried in September of uh-huh. this year. Uh-huh. And these are police officers and firefighters and uh, anyone in public safety, right, that's lost their life doing their job. Right. And of um, of all of those that are in, engraved on the monument, there, we have 29 firefighters and 29 police officers that are actually buried in Crown Hill. 
and nine of those are actually buried in the Heroes of Public Safety section. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, you want to share, Keith? Yes. Uh, it's also notable that uh, when we dedicated the section in 2001, it was at that time the only uh, section in a cemetery that honored members of all sectors of public safety. And so we, it, it's very broad-based and uh, truly does uh, pay homage to those in, in public safety. Uh-huh. Well, now let's get to public enemy number one, John Dillinger, of course, the bank robber during the Great Depression, who was born in Indianapolis and spent several years growing up on a farm near Mooresville and was killed in 1934 by federal agents when he left the Biograph Theater in Chicago. I'm sure a lot of uh, our listeners are familiar with this, buried in Crown Hill. First, let me confirm what I my understanding has always been, that his grave is the most frequently visited gravesite in the cemetery that's what um, we definitely have that impression Mm -hmm. and I've got to ask you Keith and Marty do you guys get when I talk about famous Hoosiers he's in my book because I wanted to be honest about state history we didn't only produce um, admirable people who followed the law uh I get discouraged, to be honest with you, with a continual fascination with him when there are so many other wonderful people. And I wonder if you guys experience that at Crown Hill sometimes. On, on a continuous basis. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> All the time. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think whenever we're recognized as, as being a part of Crown Hill, that's the first question. That's exactly. Asked. You right. know, when I, because I've been, uh, uh, enjoyed taking, uh, I do commentary on tours and taking groups there, and I've noticed the same thing. Well, getting into all this, it, I have to admit, from a human interest standpoint, there is fascination to it. And, um, Doug, could you kind of share what happened? I said he was shot in, shot in Chicago, and then the body lay in the Cook County morgue. Thousands of people passed by then brought back here, and there was a funeral service at his sister's house, I believe. Yeah, his father went up there with a, a local um, undertaker, as I recall, mm-hmm. to Chicago and retrieved the, the body, brought it back here. And there was some controversy about uh, Dillinger being buried at Crown Hill, but the president of uh, Crown Hill at the time, the director, said that the Dillinger family had been buried in Crown Hill for a long time. And as a matter of fact, Dillinger, John Dillinger knew Crown Hill because he was a small boy. Oh, yes. Thank you. Please explain in your book. He attended his mother's funeral. Yeah, he was three years old when his mother died. And there's a very poignant story of him being at the funeral home and standing on a chair beside his mother's casket, shaking her, trying to wake her up. So John Dillinger had had a sense of Crown Hill and his, his father arranged for Dillinger to be buried there. But after the the funeral service at at his sister's home in Indianapolis, it pretty much turned into a mob scene at Crown Hill because the newspaper, of course, had announced that the the burial was going to be happening. So by the time the the funeral cortege got to Crown Hill, there were there was a, a just a throng of uh, five thousand people outside the gate on an extremely hot day, 104 mm-hmm. degrees. The police could barely maintain uh, control of the crowd. And um, just as they buried John Dillinger, the skies let loose. It was an enormous thunderstorm as this crowd surged into Crown Hill and turned into a mob, essentially. And that didn't even cause them to scatter and go home? Mm-hmm. They, there were stories of them grabbing mud and just, you know, anything. And, and they, mm-hmm. they eventually had to come back and, and um, build essentially a giant vault over uh, Dillinger's grave. His family paid for that because they were really concerned about security that, yeah that his body mm-hmm. was going to be stolen because people were trying to buy the body after he died and uh-huh. it was a pretty crazy situation well before we leave dillinger i i want to bring up the most recent sh- surge of interest i think was after the johnny depp movie in 2009 titled public enemies and marty can you kind of report what you observed after that we had so many people from all over the world which was such a surprise to me personally that wanted to come and visit his gravesite after the movie came out. Mm-hmm. And uh, I went over there frequently because we were offering tours, special tours, you know, that would include information, history about John Dillinger. 
And I met a woman from Thailand, and I mean, they just came from all over, and they they left all kinds of mementos on his gravesite. Oh, please explain what happens. We're going to talk later about, in general, some of the other mementos, but what do you do with what's left on his, like coins and things? Well, Tom, my husband Tom, mm-hmm. the tour guide, likes to tease on his tours that we take all the money and we return it to the banks that he stole from. <laughs> <laughs> but we really don't. That's funny. The uh, money we collect off of Dillinger's grave, as well as the money that we collect off of James Wilkin Riley's grave, we donate to the Riley Foundation, Riley Children's Foundation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very appropriate. Well, more to come on our show about Crown Hill Cemetery history as it turns 150 years old. But I'm going to shift because we have our road tripper correspondent on the line. We have a guest road tripper today. Our correspondent is public historian and author Glory June Greif. Glory's a frequent guest on this show and an expert about much in our Hoosier history. Welcome to the show, Glory. Thank you, Nelson. Can I just interject that that movie starring Johnny Depp, who I really like as an actor, was just some of the worst history ever perpetrated on the public. I just have to say that. Well, it was also gory as heck. Oh, I I know. All right. Well, you have a much more cheerful (laughs) road trip (laughs) report, I think, for us, don't you? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Please share. (laughs) I always like to go to Shelbyville. Mm -hmm. And uh, normally what I like to do in Shelbyville, besides... uh, Visit the uh, the Grover Museum, which is really cool. It's on Broadway, just off the uh, public square, yeah, I, you and know, it is one of the finest county museums in the state. I some of our say. guests have praised that. I'm embarrassed to say I've never been to the. Oh, Grover you should museum. go. Uh-huh. I'm very fond of uh, of museums that uh, create recreate a historic streetscape, and they have done it in spades. I mean, they have a whole section of town recreated inside the museum, and I always find that a lot of fun. But um, it's open, uh, let's see, Tuesday through Saturday, 9 to 4, so uh, a lot of times people can get there very easily. Um, but normally what I like to do in Shelbyville is just walk around and look at the wealth of architecture. There are many, many wonderful buildings in Shelbyville, not only downtown in the commercial district, but you just walk a little, uh, particularly west, I would say, on Broadway or Washington Street, and they just have some wonderful old houses. Um the uh, the town of Shelbyville was the home of Charles Major, and so there's a memorial to Charles Major right in the public square, commemorating his novel The Bears of Blue River, which is a, a fun statue. Mm-hmm. And I um, want to lead you into the restaurant. There's a notable <laughs> restaurant. Uh, I've been there with uh, tour groups um, related to our dairy heritage. Oh yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> It's been there I a hate long, to go long to time. Shelbyville and not go to the Cow Palace. <laughs> Cow Palace, yeah, that's legendary down there. It's the Cow restaurant. Palace is is a wonderful uh, restaurant. It's it's a basic basic diner fare, but it's very very tasty. It's on North Harrison Street, which is uh, State Road Nine, and uh, mm-hmm. it's just north of the square. And it uh, was associated with the local dairy for years. And there's, uh, I mean, the ice cream is very good, but the food is very good too. There is another restaurant I, I would recommend. It's right on the public square called Tour of Italy. That hasn't been there very long. It's just getting into its third year. But it's very tasty, and you don't have to dress up, but it has a, a nice a nice uh, dressy feel to it, and the food is really good. All right. Thanks, Gloria. You painted an intriguing picture there, Shelbyville, <laughs> Indiana. You might have, want to wait till it's a little bit warmer to go walking around. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, have a great weekend. You too, Nelson. Okay, well, coming up, we'll explore more chapters in and aspects of the colorful and intriguing heritage of Crown Hill Cemetery in Indianapolis as it turns 150 years old. So stay with me and my guest, Keith Norwalk, Crown Hill's president, and two major contributors to the lavish new book titled Crown Hill, History, Spirit, Sanctuary. They are Doug Wissing and Marty Davis. We'll look at some of the largest memorial services, issues related to cemetery art, and the Pioneer Cemetery. It's been the site of reburials from lost cemeteries across Indiana. So much more to come, coming up. Hoosier History Live is underwritten in part by Story Inn, one inconvenient location since 1851, online at storyin.com, and Lucas Oil, offering oil and fuel products. More at lucasoil.com. 
and Hoosier History Live is underwritten in part by the Kurt Vonnegut Memorial Library, celebrating its third anniversary today, January 25th, from noon to 7 p.m. at 340 North Senate Avenue. More at vonnegutlibrary.org. Well, we're back. If you're just joining us, this is Hoosier History Live. I'm your host, Nelson Price. On today's show, we're looking at the heritage of an Indianapolis landmark. Crown Hill Cemetery is the third largest summer, summit, private cemetery in the country. Country. Not only are more vice presidents buried there than any other cemetery, so is the only president elected from Indiana, Benjamin Harrison, and First Lady Carolyn Scott Harrison, who died in the White House in 1892. The scenic and sprawling cemetery is the focus of a new book titled Crown Hill, History, Spirit, Sanctuary. And before we return to our topic, I'm going to pose our Hoosier History Trivia Mystery question. Today, a listener who calls in with the correct answer answer will receive a copy of the new book we've been talking about titled Crown Hill History Spirit Sanctuary and if you call in with the correct answer you'll not only receive the book you'll receive a pair of tickets to a historical tour at Crown Hill Cemetery um, this is all thanks to the Crown Hill Heritage Foundation to my guest so we really appreciate that and the phone number to call if you think you know the answer to the question I'm about to pose is 317-788-3314 I'll repeat that after I pose the question here it is a family mausoleum at Crown Hill includes the tomb's tomb of a famous Hoosier novelist and playwright who died in 1946. He was born in Indianapolis in 1869 and went on to win the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction two times, a rare accomplishment. His novels were the basis for movies in the 1930s and 40s with stars such as Katherine Hepburn. Perhaps his best-known novel was set in a city that obviously was Indianapolis, although the author gave the hometown a fictional name in the book. The movie based on that novel was directed by Orson Welles. The author also wrote a series of stories about a mischievous boy that are considered among the best ever written about Midwestern adolescents. Despite his national fame, the author continued to live in Indianapolis, although he often spent summers at the resort town of Kennebunkport, Maine. So that's a lot of clues for you. We want you to name this novelist who is entombed in a family mausoleum at Crown Hill. Well, now, shifting back to my topic and my guests, I have three guests for our exploration of historic Crown Hill Cemetery. They are Keith Norwalk, president of the cemetery and its Heritage Foundation. Also with me in studio is acclaimed Bloomington-based journalist Doug Wissing, who contributed much of the text for the new book titled Crown Hill History Spirit Sanctuary. And then many of the hundreds of photos featured in the book were taken by my third guest. She is Marty Davis, who has worked for the Crown Hill Heritage Foundation for more than 30 years, and among other things, Marty organizes tours and events, and she's known for her nature photography. Well, I'd like to explore an issue most of us realize is a challenge at any cemetery, and that unfortunately is vandalism and theft of cemetery art, particularly with all the statuary and urns and decorative ornamentation that are at grave sites. And Keith, I, I, we were talking before we went on the air, when I wrote for the Star, you contacted me and I wrote some columns about some challenges as you were having then. This was in the mid-1990s. I remember at that point, you I think you told me New Orleans, maybe because of all the antique and pawn shops there, was kind of an outlet for a lot of cemetery art. Yes, uh, there actually was a, a band of thieves who traversed the country, uh, really preying upon historic cemeteries. And mm -hmm. uh, at that time, we had a uh, it, within a very short period of time, uh, probably 15 or 20 historic uh, bronze urns stolen, uh, which later were recovered at, in antique malls in southern Indiana, and probably our most notable theft. Oh, this is, I, you've got to share this. I was leading into this. It involved, this is a fascinating story. Please go ahead with it. Well, uh, people ask, do we have animals buried at Crown Hill? Well, periodically, uh, we hear rumors that an animal was buried, uh, but probably the most famous animal uh, is a dog. And it was, it's a beautiful, uh, actually it's an iron dog, uh, weighing over a thousand pounds. A sculpture. A obviously. sculpture. Mm -hmm. And, um, a very friendly looking animal, very large. And, um, it's, um, next to a severed tree monument, which is very representative of early funerary art. Well, one day the dog, uh, disappeared. 
I remember an employee coming in saying, the dog is gone. And we, I knew right away. And um, we, we mourned the loss of the dog. Uh, we had no idea how anyone could have, have perpetrated the crime because it was so heavy. Yeah, you would have to have a truck exactly. and chains. Exactly. And, mm-hmm. and um, so, but this was uh, concurrent with the, these thieves crossing the country. So we knew the dog was somewhere. And it was only a... Um, a fairly short time after, one of our, our docents uh, who had moved uh, out of state saw in a, a uh, newsletter our dog in, sitting in a field in the state of New York. She saw a photo. She in- saw a photo. Uh-huh. And um, so we claimed the dog and <laughs> had to go through the, an arduous process of uh, validating that it was our dog. Which you, she tra- you guys tracked down where the photo was exactly, shot. Exactly, exactly. Gosh, it's like detective work. That's right, that's right. And um, so ultimately we were able to prove that it was our dog. And so uh, our foundation paid to for the dog's return trip. And he came back on a flatbed truck and we had a news conference and celebrated his return. He is now anchored with rebar and he will never leave, okay. leave his home again. And I, I think you mentioned this, but just to make it clear, he's in addition to being by these trees and other sculptures, he's by his master in Absolutely. life where his master is buried. Yes. And interesting, mm-hmm. his master owned a hardware store. So oh. he, he aspired to um, uh, dogs, obviously, uh-huh. and, and hunting because many of the uh, symbols on the monument are hunting. Well, related. let's credit this sharp-eyed docent because she's actually been a guest on this show. <laughs> uh, it's Sheila Riley. She's an expert on Victorian-era morning customs. Well, we have callers on every line for our trivia question. Um, let's go to Greg. Greg, you are on the air now. Do you think you know the name of the novelist I described who's entombed in a family mausoleum at Crown Hill? Uh, I think so. Booth Tarkington? Yes, your congratulations, Greg. You have won this new book titled Crown Hill, History, Spirit, Sanctuary, and you've won a pair of tickets to a historical tour at Crown Hill. So, Greg, how did you know the answer? Uh, I, I've taken the tour a few times before, <laughs> uh, several years, and keep coming back. All right. Well, good. Stay on the line, Greg, and our production uh, uh, person, Jen, will get your contact info, and then we'll send this prize this prize pack to you. Um, All right, to, thank you. Uh-huh, to elaborate, uh, as Greg said, the answer is Booth Tarkington. The famous author and playwright was an Indianapolis native. He was living at a mansion on North Meridian Street at his death in 1946, and he was entombed in Crown Hill. From the book, I noticed it's his family mausoleum. It's a Tarkington, Jameson family mausoleum. It's in section 13 of the cemetery and he won his Pulitzers for the novels Alice Adams and that was the one made in the movie um, in the 30s with Catherine Hepburn and also for his masterpiece of Magnificent Ambersons that's a novel set uh, in a midwestern city that's obvious Indianapolis. He called it Midland. Um, And the location of this family mausoleum, Marty, it's sort of near the James Whitcomb Riley, um, the crown of Crown Hill. Right. If you come down the hill from the crown, uh, Section 13 will be right there. And it's actually where President Benjamin Harrison is also buried. Mm-hmm. And there is a walkway that goes from the side of the section to Harrison's memorial. And right when you get to the end of the walkway, if you looked left, then Tarkington's mausoleum is right there. Mm-hmm. And since we're on the topic now of architectural features, I want to mention some and then invite you guys to comment if you like. Uh, the thing, that, to me, there's nothing in Indianapolis like your Gothic gate there right off the eastern entryway of the cemetery on West 34th Street. And um, it was built in 1885, I know from the book. And Marty, your office is right near that. What are the reactions of visitors when they see it? Well, most people have cameras when they, you mm-hmm. know, have a chance to get out and look at it. I mean, it's just a magnificent gate. I uh, am very privileged to be able to look out my office window and look at this gate mm-hmm. every day. So it's a beautiful gate. It's mm-hmm. very large and uh it's, there's just nothing like it anywhere. And then you have a Gothic chapel that opened in 1887. That's not far from the James Wickham Riley, um, the crown there at Crown Hill. And I think you have, you were telling me before we went on the air, you've got a 
kind of fundraising effort going on related to that Gothic chapel? We actually, uh, several years ago, did a major restoration on the chapel. Mm -hmm. And historically, it's fascinating. It was uh, originally uh, had uh, 96 crypt spaces for um, holding the deceased in the winter months when we couldn't make burials. It served as office. It served as storage. Uh, we now have restored it back to its grandeur and had a uh, over two and a half million dollar restoration. It is absolutely spectacular. We've got a beautiful new pipe organ. Uh, it's used for committal services, funerals, and also private events. And it, mm -hmm. it's really the jewel of Crown Hill. Oh, well, very cool. Well, I think what's interesting, too, about that is mm -hmm. we restored it for two and a half million. It was originally built in 1875 for about $39,000. <laughs> I mean, so the it was built one more time with that date. Eight, it was oh, well, 1875. 1875. That's right. right. That's what I said. All right. Well, I'm going to move to my guest, Doug, because in terms of crowd crowds at Crown Hill, apparently one of the biggest ever. We talked about Dillinger and the throngs there, but one of the biggest ever was actually for a humble potholder salesman. This was in 1971, and there's really quite a poignant story about the way it unfolded. Uh, uh, the salesman had been unknown to the public for most of his life, um, named Herbert Wirth, W-I-R-T-H. Can you kind of describe what happened there, Doug? Yeah, Her Herbie Wirth was a, a small man, a bird of a man, who would go door to door in the neighborhood north of Crown Hill in a way, almost up to Broad Ripple, and that was his neighborhood. He kind of lived there with his mother, and he would go door to door with a couple of shopping bags filled with kitchen towels and pot holders and washcloths, bandanas, shoelaces, stuff like that. Everything was a quarter except for, for one uh, one particularly fancy pot holder that a neighbor girl did. And they were 50 cents, but he didn't take any commission. He just sold them for the young girl. And he would, he'd go door to door and he'd smile and chat with the people. And uh, three times a year, Herbie's winter and summer, he would come to your door and ask if he'd want something kind of walked along. He was he was a real fixture. People would note he had this little kind of shuffle jog as he would go along. He did it for 25 years. And he was just a polite guy. He he People would ask him about his life. And at, at some point, his mother died. He buried her in Crown Hill. He bought an extra lot for himself because he was a tidy guy. And he took care of things. And he'd never gotten married. People would ask him about that. And he would have kind of an awkward little conversation. And he would go on. And... uh at some point, the star columnist Tom Keating mm -hmm. wrote a legendary columnist mm. there in the 70s and 80s. And he wrote a wonderful uh, article about Herbie Worth and Herbie's position of knowing where he was in the world. He understood his place in the social hierarchy, yet he understood he could help make people's lives a little better. And he, Herbie told Tom Keating, he said, there won't be much of a dent in the world when I die. But at least I can say I made an honest to God try to do what I did as a nice man. And Worth died in 1971. He was at his favorite North Side, rest, or North Side supermarket waiting for a, a shipment of his favorite bread. And initially people were a little concerned that, you know, what was going to happen with the funeral. And then they realized that he had taken care of everything. Well, Tom Keating heard that Herbie had died. And so he wrote another column. And Herbie had said that, uh, that Herbie, or I'm sorry, Tom Keating wrote that Herbie didn't want to have a funeral ceremony in a funeral home or a church. He just wanted to have something at the graveside. And he was hoping some people would be there. So the day of the funeral, there were some people there. There were thousands of people that came. People came in droves to Herbie Worth's funeral. And the, uh, there's a wonderful bell that was in, that's in the, uh, the waiting station beside the Gothic, uh, beside the Gothic gates. It had been out of repair for decades. It had just been repaired. So someone rushed in there and started ringing the bell. The first time the bell had been rung in decades. And it was one of the most heavily attended Funerals in Crown Hill, and it was history. a diverse crowd. Apparently, like movers and shakers, civic leaders, as well as just common people. Common people, rich and poor, mm -hmm. black and white, young and old, mm -hmm. hippies and soldiers and businessmen. They all gathered for 
Herbie Worth's funeral. Uh huh. Well, coming up, we'll have more with my guests Keith Norwalk, Marty Davis, and Doug Wissing as we explore the heritage of Crown Hill Cemetery, where there have been more than 200,000 burials since the very first in 1864. We're at the point in the show where we welcome your phone calls with questions, comments, and insights on our topic. We invite you to join the conversation on the air. The phone number to join us if you have questions or insights you want to share. Uh, we love to hear from you. The number to call is 317-788-3314. So more ahead coming up. And again, it's 788-3314. Hoosier History Live is underwritten in part by Story In, one inconvenient location since 1851, online at storyin.com. And Lucas Oil, offering oil and fuel products. More at lucasoil.com. And Hoosier History Live is underwritten in part by Legacy Keepers, an educational charity dedicated to the preservation of traditional folk and American music. Legacy Keepers concerts tonight at 7 and 8 p.m. at the Logan Street Sanctuary in Noblesville. Well, we're back. If you're just joining us, this is Hoosier History Live. I'm your host, Nelson Price. I'd like to extend a couple of invitations. The first is save the date. That's for our annual Hoosier History Live anniversary party. We've been on the air for six years now, and our annual party has become a truly wonderful and jammed event. More than 200 or so distinguished people typically attend. All studio guests from day one are invited, as well as all listeners and friends of the show. We're working out details, but we know it will be February 27th. That's a Thursday from 5 to 7 p- 7.30 p.m. at the Indiana Landmark Center, 12th and Central Avenue in Indy. I'll keep you posted. Um, you typically, we have mayors of several Indiana cities at our party. And I'd like to uh, extend an invitation to everyone to visit our website at HoosierHistoryLive.org. It's a trove of information and visuals about the more than 270 history topics and guests that have been the focus of our show. Well, Well, uh, on today's show, we are exploring the 150-year history of Crown Hill Cemetery in Indianapolis. It's been a landmark in the Hoosier capital since the Civil War and is the subject of a lavish new book published by the Indiana Historical Society Press. I'm joined in studio by Keith Norwalk, president of Crown Hill, and by two guests who contributed extensively to the book. They are Bloomington-based journalist Doug Wissing and photographer Marty Davis. Marty is the public relations coordinator for the Crown Hill Heritage Foundation. I would like um, each of my guests to highlight some of the distinctive grave markers. There's many of them, but I'm going to mention two I always point out that catch my eye. Um, The marker for former Indianapolis Colts owner Robert Ursay, the father of current team owner Jim Ursay. There's a large horseshoe, obviously symbolizing the Colts, emblazoned on it. Also the grave site of legendary Butler University basketball and football coach Tony Hinkle, who died in the 1990s. It has a wet else a butler bulldog uh, mascot on it so uh, let's start with Keith Uh, Keith and Marty have both been on the premises so long and I'd like to have you share one that resonates with you Keith one of the memorials that is very meaningful to me is also very contemporary and it's Mm -hmm. one of the few extremely contemporary monuments but it's also very heartfelt art uh, many times families design and commission their own monuments. This actually is a contemporary bronze sculpture, which consists of seven upright rectangles. And one looks at it and doesn't know the story necessarily, but there was a uh, student, a North Central a high school student by the name of Jeffrey Bratton, who had the idea for this sculpture. And um, he before he could execute the plan, he he died of cancer, very tragically at a very, very early age. Yeah, he must have been like 16, Absolutely. 17. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And his parents commissioned an Ohio sculptor to make this uh, or to construct, design and construct the memorial, which is just a very poignant a reminder to his family and to everyone of the great talent of this young man. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And then shifting to Marty, and I'm going to lead into this by pointing out uh, my guest Marty Davis is a butterfly aficionado. You you raise them, uh, hundreds right. of them, <laughs> thousands, really. Thousands. Right? Yes. All right. Well, twenty five so, years. All right. Your uh, this evocative uh, gravesite you want to share relates to butterflies. 
Well, Ann Ryder uh, has contributed to our book with a very nice uh, part in the end called October Sky. And, um, you know, it was the graves, it is the gravesite of her mom who died in 1975. And Ann and I met through butterflies. And so she also raises butterflies now. Guess what? I'm going to interrupt you because oh. we have, I've got an alert here. We have Ann Ryder on the line. Welcome to the show, Ann. Ann, uh, for any listener who might not know, Ann was our longtime and widely admired uh, TV news anchor here in Indianapolis. And uh, I hope you've been able to listen to some of this, Ann. We're talking right now about the Marty is describing uh, the burial site for your mom. I have. I, in fact, I've listened to the whole show. Um, and I love Crown Hill. Um, and I, I sort of feel like I can speak to the spirit of the place, you know, because the book is, is, you know, it's called Crown Hill History, Spirit, Sanctuary. It's really all three, but it's been a place of spirit for me, um, in large part because my mom is buried there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and she uh, died, I think, I in the 1970s, that. correct? Like 1975, yeah. something. And Marty was just at the point of, I led her into this by explaining there's a butterfly connection with this. Mm-hmm. So yeah. uh, both of you, uh, Marty, why don't you go ahead with uh, with this? Well, the butterflies, um, because I raised butterflies, and Ann and I met through butterflies at a, a grief, grief uh, camp for children, uh, Anne lost her own son uh, while she was pregnant and almost died herself. And in dealing with her own grief, she decided that she wanted to also raise butterflies. And so it's really through the metamorphosis process and that whole experience that, you know, she was able to find her own healing through the butterflies. And so she, she's been able to share those quite a bit out at Crown Hill at her mom's grave. Uh huh. Oh, very neat. Anything you want to add to that, Anne? Sure. Yes, very much so. One of the things that I love about Crown Hill is that it's a place um, where you can get very quiet um, and where nature almost becomes the conduit between the, the, the here and the there. And by that I mean um, life and death. So that... Um, you know, if you spend some time there, you know, it's not unusual um, to see a deer. It's not unusual to have a butterfly experience. Um, it's not unusual just to get a sense that you're really not that far from your loved one. So I've had all of those experiences out there. And get, in getting to know Marty and in getting to become familiar with the butterfly experience, which, as she said, they're they're a metaphor for everything. You know, the way that they develop and, and go from the egg to the caterpillar um, to spending time in the chrysalis where, where they're very confined and in a very vulnerable state right before they pop out with their wings. Um, it, it, it became a very meaningful metaphor for me for um, the grief process and then sort of moving on. Um, mm-hmm. It became kind of synonymous with getting through grief and and. In some ways, it's synonymous with the passing on and with death. Uh-huh. Um, well, I, I am so grateful you call in. I don't mean to interrupt you. We just have yeah. some other topics to go to. But I do want to point out that Anne's father, Henry Ryder, has been a trivia winner in the past, uh, since we've been talking <laughs> about James Wickham Riley earlier in the show and his, um, the crown at Crown Hill where Riley is entombed. Uh, Anne's father, Henry, is a well-known reenactor as James Wickham Riley. So thank you so much, Anne. I'm, sure. I'm very grateful you called in. And well, thank you. Thank you. And I want to now um, shift over to my guest, Doug, because we had Keith and uh, Marty share evocative grade sites. And this, what we're going to get to now is not evocative, but it's interesting social history, and it concerns a Dutch immigrant. Um, I have trouble pronouncing the name, but he had come to America, um, and the, the grave site is in the shape of a Dutch barn or house from the early 1900s. Can you kind of share what happened and what's on the gravesite, Doug? Yeah, when, when I w- first started working on researching the book, Tom Davis, Marty's husband, was kind enough to take me around and show me the highlights of the cemetery and give me some basic orientation. And there was one gravesite that he pointed out that was incredibly uh, poignant, and yet it was very puzzling. N- nobody really knew much about it. The man's name 
was Peter Grutendorst, who was born in the Netherlands. And as you mentioned, his, his grave marker is in the shape of a, a traditional Dutch barn or, or, or a Dutch house. And on the roof of this tiny structure, there was um, Grutendorst's uh, name and, and the date that he was you know, b- born and buried. And then on the other side, on the roof, was inscribed this very odd uh, thing. It said, here lies the body of Peter Grutendorst, born in Holland, September 29th, 1918. I came to America in 1949 and wanted to love this beautiful country. And I found out it was corrupt and that there is no opportunity for people who want to do right. So I am gone and may the Lord take my soul. Well, that was certainly intriguing. And it seemed to be a good thing to try to untangle what, what was, what was Pete Grutendorf's problem that caused mm-hmm. him to leave this legacy for us. And, and I found out that Pete had good reason to be disillusioned with America. So you just did this on your own, Doug? You did sort of detective work to find yeah, out I'm what an, I'm an investigative journalist. So <laughs> right. this is like, All right. I'm trained as a historian. This yeah. is like raw meat for me. <laughs> okay. And uh, so I started digging into it, and I started finding a few things here and there. And then it was, it was uh, very cold weather. It was maybe around the holidays, and I was working on this section of the book, and Digging around, I found one newspaper clipping that gave me a little bit of, and I have friends at the Indianapolis Public Library, and they in turn introduced me to some reference librarians who were bored. They were really bored. It was during Christmas break, I think. And so we started working on this together, and I think as librarians would leave one shift, they might find one little piece, and then I would find something else, and then that would in turn go to another of the reference librarians, and they would find something. So, So between us all, we pieced the whole story together. So at, at one point you asked me to read a short section of the book. And so maybe what I'm going to do is read a short section of the book to tell you the story of Pete Grutendorst and why he was so disillusioned. Okay, it's going to have to be very short. <laughs> well, maybe I'm just going to run through it. Pete was, a, Pete was an immigrant. He was an entrepreneur. And he owned a little restaurant besides some investment properties down in, um, what would that be, the northeast part of Indianapolis around 16th Street. So he owned a place called the Humpty Dumpty Carryout Restaurant on East Michigan Avenue, East Michigan Street, 1315 East Michigan. And he was there one night, and this is when that part of town was kind of rough. And he was there one night, and um, a 13-year-old boy named Lanky Lee Wiesenschent and his uncle Troy Statz came into the house, came into the restaurant, pulled guns, and a gunfight started because Pete also packed a, a gun under his uh, apron. When it was over with, the son had been shot, st- managed to stumble out the door where his father was waiting in the getaway car. The father essentially left his dying son on the sidewalk and took off. Pete was hit four times uh, in the stomach, chest, and legs. And uh, he was in critical condition. He wasn't expected to live. Well, when he... he Actually did, but he had uh, he had a pretty severe kidney wound that that really uh, embittered him, and um, he was he was in critical care for a long time. Came out he by the time he got out he had lost all of these things that he had gathered together in his little estate, his his investment properties, his his restaurant, and uh, he lived until 1990. One of the detectives said, "Old oh, Pete'll fool you. He's really a tough guy." And he said he was going to survive, and he did until 1990. And um, that's that, that's the story. That's yeah, why he put that on here. Very bitter. Own. Well, listen, we have several things that we want to get to, and we're almost out of time. But let's. I do want to uh, give Keith a moment to weigh in a little bit or share about the AIDS memorial. Um, and I was unfamiliar with this. So. Thank you, Nelson. I think one of the important components of a cemetery is to serve as a chronicle of what's happening in the community, societally, Mm -hmm. historically. The Indiana AIDS Memorial was erected in the year 2000 uh, through a grant from the uh, Indiana AIDS Fund uh, of the Greater uh, Indiana Health Foundation. And it's beautiful. It's on uh, a site in the woods just north of the Crown, and it represents uh, and it honors and recognizes those have, who have succumbed to AIDS-related illnesses. And it's a, a 12-foot 
uh, bronze of uh, intertwined hands. Just very quickly, a very poignant mm-hmm. little story. I often drive through the cemetery on my way into the office. And one morning, uh, two springs ago, I drove next to the AIDS memorial and I saw an, a very elderly couple. And um, the the gentleman was on a very small step ladder and the, the woman was holding the ladder. And the gentleman was actually doing a rubbing of a name on the memorial. And it just seemed so poignant because mm-hmm. it was it was obviously like um, a son, a, a son or, or mm-hmm. a, an important person to this couple. And it just showed that that memorial um, does not leave anyone behind who has succumbed mm-hmm. to these illnesses. And like you said, two tablets, it's like um, tablets of hands. Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. All right, well, Marty, I want to give you a chance too here because uh, we talked about Ann Ryder and the butterfly. But then with flowers, we haven't had a chance yet to explore the thousands of flowers and trees. And the flower aspect involves um, human interest aspect that interests me the most, um, you alerted me to daffodils and a woman from Morgan County uh, who died in 2002. Can you share a little bit about this? Sure. Helen Lank uh, was married to Dr. Goethe Lank, and he was one of the founders of the IU Med School and a surgeon. And he built, uh, they bought this property, and he built this large uh, observatory. But Helen, she was a botanist, and she was the former vice president of the American Daffodil Society. And so her passion was daffodils. And over the years, she developed probably hundreds of cultivars of her own species of daffodils. And uh, there are, she had planted about 1,100 varieties on this property that they have. And you can still visit there in April on the weekends. Mm -hmm. But And we used to go down there on the weekends, and then I found out she was buried. She and her husband were buried at Crown Hill. And I got this idea, well, we need to bring her some of her cultivars here, her daffodils. Mm -hmm. And so I contacted the uh, Indiana Daffodil Society, and they were kind enough to, because they maintain the gardens, and they were kind enough to bring some of her flowers and bury them around their monument and also around a Greek statue. And so every spring, we just have all kinds of daffodils, and it really is a part of Helen that just continues to live on. A very yeah. important part. And Marty uh, sent me a note that, that I love your quote in this. Every spring, an important part of Helen Link blooms again as um, she rests nearby. Well, we are getting close to the end of the show. Is there anything you want to add, Keith, that we haven't brought up? We haven't had a chance to explore the Pioneer Cemetery that will have to wait until another day. But yes. do you want to add anything quickly about it? Just very quickly. Uh, I, we appreciate this time to share some of the beauty of Crown Hill, the story just go mm-hmm. on and on mm-hmm. and it's really very daunting to to be at Crown Hill and just recognize that there are great stories, there are lesser stories Whoa. every life has a story yes, and uh, we have discussed the Pioneer Cemetery on earlier shows, we'll just have to have you back or something to explain but it's the site of reburials um, it, our listeners might remember in recent years there was a Frontier Cemetery in the Castleton area it was Methodist Church like a, a Pioneer Methodist Church minister and congregants were reburied at Crown Hill because this, the initial cemetery was taken for, if I remember, it wasn't the expansion of I-69 yes. there. Right. Uh-huh. So, And then this is, it, these reburials have kind of spawned other cemeteries to do that kind of thing. Very definitely. We have we have four small cemeteries that, that go back to the very early 1800s that are mm-hmm. all together in one section on the North Grounds. Uh huh. Well, last, we're out of time. Thanks so much to my guests, Keith Norwalk, Marty Davis, and Doug Wissing. You guys have been so enlightening and informative on this Indianapolis landmark. Next week, this being the dead of winter, the absolute worst in decades, we're going to share the heritage of outreach to families, children, seniors, and the homeless by some organizations with a deep Hoosier heritage, often motivated by faith traditions. This means we'll look at the 120-year history of Wheeler Mission Ministries, which has had 
it began actually with a rescue mag wagon in its early days. And Wheeler just announced plans for a major new facility for homeless men in downtrodden Indy, downtown Indy, excuse me, homeless men in downtown Indy. We're also going to look at Lutheran Child and Family Services that started in the 1880s with an orphanage opened by German immigrants. And my guests will include Lindsay Mintz of the Jewish Community Relations Council. She's going to share insights about the beginnings of Hooverwood, it clear back in 1902, as well as many other aspects of social service outreach by the Jewish community in Indy. So I hope you'll join us next week. Thanks to all of you for sharing part of your day with us today. Let's make some Hoosier history. There's more online at HoosierHistoryLive.org. And you can like us on Facebook at Hoosier History Live and follow us on Twitter at Hoosier Hist Live. Molly Head, producer. Special thanks to... Legacy Keepers, Richard Sullivan, Pam Frazier, Derek Lohorn, and 88.7 The Diamond.